Let's close our eyes for prayer. Our Father, we do thank you for our Bible story tonight. Thank you for the joy of coming before you as your children and listening to your word and hearing the Spirit of God that inspired the Holy Scriptures speaking to us directly in our hearts. We pray, Lord, that the teaching will come tonight with illumination and enlightenment in Jesus' name. And we pray, Lord, that the entrance of your word will come light in our soul, direction to our steps, joy in our spirit, confidence and assurance within us that we'll be able to walk the path of righteousness by that power and that strength which your word and your spirit supply in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that after studying all this series of studies, as we go from chapter to chapter and from verse to verse, we pray that none of us will remain weak in Jesus' name. But you'll give us strength. And in that strength, we'll be able to stand and walk in the perfect will of God in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, for today. Thank you for the study we're going to have. Give us more confidence, steadfastness, assurance, on the authority of your word. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Yeah. We're looking at Second Peter. We started the epistle to, uh, the general epistle of Peter, the second epistle, a few weeks ago now. And now we're in chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. Tonight we're talking about the scriptures. And the scripture is the more sure word of prophecy. Actually, uh, those words you'll find exactly in verse 19, where it says, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. That's referring to the scriptures. It's referring to the whole Bible. By the way, when Peter said, we have a more sure word, it's making comparison. It's saying, this is number one. This is number two. This number two is more sure word or prophecy than number one. What's really funny to us, number one? You go back to verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory. When there came such a voice from him, to him, from the excellent glory, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. This voice, which came from heaven, we heard. When we were with him in the holy mount. That's exactly what he was referring to as the very first thing that gives us the assurance of the certainty of the coming of the Lord. He speaks about the power of Christ. And the coming of Christ. And he said, we're very sure that we have not followed cunningly devised fables. He was recalling and he was testifying about his experience on the Mount of Transfiguration. He was one of those eyewitnesses of Christ's glory, Christ's honor, Christ's majesty on that Mount of Transfiguration. He also heard, along with the other two disciples, the voice of God coming from the excellent glory. That is, coming from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Now he testified that this voice, which came from heaven, that they all had it. When they were with him in that holy mount, it was a memorable experience, which assured him that these apostles... And the church of the living God were not following some lies and deception and error and false doctrine, cunningly devised fables. That experience confirmed the certainty of the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. His experience then on that Mount of Transfiguration is superior to any experience, any vision, any revelation, any supernatural visitation anybody can have today, anybody has ever had from that time until this time, until the time of the rapture. And he said, we're very sure of the coming of the Lord because actually we saw it. Because they have told us that you will not see death, some of you standing here, until you see the Son of Man coming in his glory. And then he revealed that to them on the mount. Then he says something now. He said, 
even that experience of the transfiguration, even the voice we had there, even the certain chief that that thing created when we saw and when we heard, do you know there is still something greater? He was saying, he was saying then, beyond that experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Actually, when he said that, he was referring to the entire Old Testament. When he says, watch a prophecy, obviously he was referring to the Old Testament, the minor prophets, and the major prophets. When you think about the writings of Isaiah, and the writings of Jeremiah, and the writings of um, Ezekiel, and the writings of Daniel, and Osea, and Joel, and Jonah, and Nahum, all through to Malachi, you know we are talking about the word of prophecy. But you know that as we look at other parts of the Bible, Moses was referred to as a prophet. David was referred to as a prophet. And the other writers of the Old Testament, they were referred to as prophets. So it combines then the whole of the Old Testament from Genesis all through to Malachi. And it's saying all those revelations you have, all those writings you have, all those scriptures you have in the Old Testament, that is the most sure word of prophecy. And then it goes on in that verse 19, we have also a most sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place unto the day dawn and the day and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. It's telling us that all those things we have read about in the Old Testament. From the very beginning until the very end of the Old Testament, that they didn't come by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He tells us then, it's talking about the Old Testament. And as you think about the New Testament, you will understand that the New Testament is as inspired as the Old Testament. How do we know that? Because we're told in John chapter 14, verse 26, John 14, 26, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Everything is said, all those things recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Holy Spirit revealed unto them and reminded them all the things that he said. That's how we know that those historical parts of the gospel, they are inspired. But then it also says that Holy Ghost shall teach you all things. That comes now with the Acts and also with the Epistles, all through the Revelation. That means then both the historical part and the gospel account and the church account in Acts of the Apostles and all the, all the epistles inspired of the Holy Ghost, which means then if we say the Old Testament is inspired and the New Testament is inspired, the combination of both, that's the entire Bible. It means then that the Holy Bible in its entirety, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the Holy Scriptures in short, that's the most sure word of prophecy spoken and written by holy men of God, moved by the Holy Ghost. And it's more authoritative than any experience coming from anyone. Think about it. If the Holy Scriptures are weightier, are more solid, are more dependable than the vision on the Mount of Transfiguration, and the vision on the Mount of Transfiguration is more solid, is more trustworthy, it's more dependable than any dream, any vision, any revelation, any encounter, any divine visitation today. It means then the word of God is more important, is more trustworthy, is more dependable than any revelation that anybody is claiming today. That's the reason it's very important for you and for me as we look at the word of God together today to understand that these scriptures, they form... They constitute the more sure word of prophecy. In John chapter 16, 
verse 13. How be it, when the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Which means then, as we look at all this, you see that the Old Testament is referred to as the Scriptures, and even the New Testament is referred to as the Scriptures. In Second Peter chapter 3, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 16, here is Peter writing, and he's going to comment now, not, not on the Old Testament anymore, he's going to comment on the writings of Paul the Apostle. Let's see the weight and the value he gives of the writings of Paul the Apostle. It says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, as also in all his epistles, talking about the epistles of Paul, if you go back to verse 15, let's go back to verse 15, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, as reaching unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in the which are, are some things had to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest to his distort, as they do also all the scriptures unto their own destruction. So then you see that it was referring to the writings of Paul the Apostle as other scriptures as scriptures and then all the other writings of the new testament as other scriptures everything then forms the scriptures and this is the most sure word of prophecy as we look at this study tonight we're looking at three points number one dependence on the practical illumination of the scripture dependence on the practical illumination of the scripture what do we say the practical illumination of the scripture. Look at verse 19. It says, we have also a most sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light illumination. Illumination. A light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, until the day star rise in your hearts. Point number two. The danger of private interpretation of scripture. The danger of private interpretation of scripture. You look at verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Whenever anybody gets into uh, privately interpreting the word of God, giving some private secret meaning to the word of God, he gets into spiritual danger. And he gets, he gets into a lot of danger and there's enormous responsibility on anybody that, you know, tries to take the word of God and he makes a private, secret, personal interpretation that contradicts every other part of scripture. Point number three, doctrine, the doctrine of plenary inspiration of the scripture. Plenary, you know, just means, you know, the, the fullness of scripture. Everything, totality of the scripture. Is given by the inspiration of God. And this is the doctrine of the plenary inspiration. Every believer ought to understand that the Bible you carry in your hand is not an ordinary book. It's inspired of God. And it's inspired, breathed out by the Spirit of God. And you ought to understand, you ought to believe, you ought to stand on this doctrine of the plenary inspiration of Scripture. In verse 21 it says, For the prophecy came not in all time by the will of man. They didn't just write what they wanted to write. They didn't just say what they wanted to say. They didn't just preach what they wanted to preach. The prophecy came not in all time by the will of man, but Holy men of God spake as they were moved, as they were influenced, as they were inspired, as they were carried along by the Holy Ghost. Let's go back to point number one. Dependence on the practical illumination of the scriptures. In this verse 19, chapter 1, verse 19, we have also a much sure word of prophecy. Whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn, until the day star arise in your heart. As we look at that verse of scripture, 
you can break that verse of scripture into three parts. Part one, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Part two, that sure word of prophecy, you will do well if you take heed. You will do well if you take heed unto its commandments, unto its promises, unto its correction, unto its warning, unto all that the scripture is saying in preparing you for the coming of the Lord. Part three, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. It's telling you that this world is a world of darkness. And this word of God is what gives you light. It's like you're walking on a dark street and with danger all around you. And it is, and then the, if there's no street light, then there is danger. But it says, if the street light comes on, light comes on, you're able to walk safe, and you're able to avoid any danger, any disruption of your path, in your path. That's why it's saying, number one, this is the word, more sure word of prophecy. Number two, you take heed to everything you read, everything you hear, everything you learn, everything you study in the word of God, part three of that verse, because it's the light that is shining in a dark place, and it will keep on shining until the day dawn, until the day star arise in your heart. That means until the light of the world will come from the sky, and the day star will appear, the Lord Jesus Christ himself and we will be with him forever and ever. Let's look at that, dependence on the practical illumination of the scripture. In Ezekiel chapter 25, uh, Ezekiel chapter 12 rather, Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25. Remember the parts of that, of that verse we are talking about? Remember that this is the more sure word of prophecy. Ezekiel 12, verse 25. For I am the Lord. I will speak. And the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall no more be prolonged. For in your day, so rebellious house, will I say the word and will perform it, says the Lord God. Do you understand then why Peter was saying this is a more sure word of prophecy? It cannot fail. Because Almighty God, when he gave the word, he said, I have given the word when I speak, that word that I speak shall come to pass. Therefore, you can trust it. You can depend upon it. You can rely on it. Because it's a more sure word of prophecy. Actually, when Jesus came into this world and he began to teach the people, he brought up. That he built up a confidence of the people on the word of God. As you look at the writings of the New Testament, and you look at the things that Jesus taught, and the things that Jesus said, there is something you are going to discover, that Jesus Christ built up, built up confidence in the word of God. You know, it's not like many preachers today that will be preaching and will be casting doubts in the minds of people concerning this verse, concerning this section of the Bible, concerning this promise of the Bible, concerning this commandment of the Bible, Jesus Christ built up confidence in the word of God. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 18, Matthew chapter 5 verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one judge... Or title, the smallest part, the smallest sentence, the smallest word of that scripture, not one judge or title shall pass from the law till all be fulfilled. No wonder Peter said, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. If the church will realize today, if every Christian will realize today, that your dreams are not as important as the word of God. That revelations you claim, they are not as important as the word of God. That the prophecy coming from anybody, coming from any prophet, coming from any charismatic church, any Pentecostal church, that the prophecy coming in writing, or coming in cassette, or coming from any friend uh, from this, the other church on the other side of the road, that all those prophecies are not as trustworthy, as important, as solid, as dependable as the word of God. That when you have the Bible, 
when you have the prophecies of the Bible and the promises of the Bible and the commandments of the Bible and the warnings in the Bible and the statements in the Bible, you have a more sure word of prophecy. All those things can be changed. Your dreams may depend on many, many factors, many, many things in your life and in your surroundings. And the visions that people receive may depend on many, many things. But this one is built on this solid ground, the Word of God. And the Bible stands, and it still stands today. And that's why you should cast away all your fears concerning that dream and concerning that prophecy because we have a more sure word of prophecy, and that's what you find in the Bible. In Luke chapter 21, Luke chapter 21, Reading verse 33, Luke 21, 33. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. And you realize that if you woke up in the morning, and then you look up and there's no sky, it surprises you. Because in your mind, you know the stability and the steadfastness of the sun and the moon and the sky and the sky and the stars and the earth and the sea, and the ocean, and the rivers, and all those things that are there, you think they are there forever. But the Lord is saying, if it surprises you, that the heavens are cleared away, and the stars are not there, and the sun is not there, and the moon is not there, if that surprises you, how about the word of God? It says, it's very easy, it's very possible for the sky, and for the moon, and for the sun, and for everything you see, everything that appears stable, the earth and the heaven, it will pass away. But the words of God shall not pass away. And that's how sure it is. That's why Peter was saying we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Uh, come to the Old Testament in Psalm 19. Psalm 19, I'm reading to you from verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous. All together, he's talking about the scriptures. And he's using different, different words to describe the word of God. To describe the mind of God. To describe the counsel of God. To describe the testimonies of God. And it gives us seven things. It says, number one, reading from verse seven, that word is perfect. Number two, that word is sure. In verse eight, number three, that word is right. Then, in num number four, in verse eight, that word is pure. Number nine, that, uh, verse nine, number, number five, that word is clean. Number six, is true. Number seven, is righteous altogether. So you understand the word of God. With all those adjectives qualifying it, and with all those descriptions telling us about what the word of God is, it is when Peter th thought about everything. That's why he said, we have a more sure word of prophecy. Come to Psalm 119. Psalm 119. In Psalm 119, I'm reading to you from verse 89. 119 verse 89 forever O lord thy word is settled in heaven your dreams are not forever settled in heaven your visions are not forever settled in heaven your revelations are not forever settled in heaven all those experiences you are talking about and it's bringing fear in your heart that you are saying well i had this dream i had this visitation i had this experience all those things are not forever settled in heaven there is something that is more sure word of prophecy all these people that are rising up, you know, in this new church and this new assembly, revelations are going on there, and people may be rushing here and rushing there. I want to go and hear my own prophecy and my own revelation. All those things are chaff, and the wind of time and the wind of circumstances will blow them away. There is something that the wind of time and the wind of circumstances will never blow away. That is the word of God. That's why Peter the apostle is calling us back to the word, and he says, see, all these things you are running about and you are running after, everything will vanish away. And the wind of time and the wind of circumstances will blow them away. There is something that is more sure than any of those things and it is the word of God. That's why it says in verse 89, 
forever, O Lord, thy watch is settled in heaven. Verse 19, thy, thy faithfulness is unto all generations. Thou hast established the earth, and it abideth. They continue, verse 91, this day, according to thy ordinances for all are thy servants. And then he tells us in verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Isn't that the reason why Peter was saying that you do well when you take heed unto this short word of prophecy because it has a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and until the day star appear in your heart. It says over here in verse 105, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and then it says a light unto my path in verse 130 that is 130 it says the entrance of thy words giveth light it giveth understanding unto the simple the entrance of your word when there is confusion in your heart when there is darkness in your heart when the clouds are hanging low you go back to this sure word of prophecy your circumstances are not sure and your situations are not sure and all the things around you, they are not sure. The wind that blows and the, and the storm that comes, all those things are not sure. When all these confusing things happen in your life, there is a place you can go back to that you'll be able to stand firm and the rain will fall and the wind will blow and the storm will come and the sea will rage. And yet when you are standing upon this word that is settled forever in heaven, as sure as the word is, so your stand will also be sure. That's why it says the entrance of your words they give light and it gives understanding unto the simple uh, verse 138 138 it says thy testimonies that thou hast commanded are righteous and very faithful and then in verse 142 it says thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness thy law is the truth Thy law, the law of God, the word of God, it is the truth. All your feelings and all your ideas and all your opinions and all your psychology and all your philosophy and all the thoughts of your heart, all those things are not stable. They're shifting sand. And the wind will blow them away. There is something that is stable. There is something that is steadfast. There is something that is solid. There is something that will never, never be affected by anything happening in this world. That thing is this more sure word of prophecy, the word of God. That's why it says here, thy word is the truth. And then it tells us in verse 144, that the righteousness of thy testimonies is everlasting. The dependability, the trustworthiness of your testimonies, of your truth, of your word, is for everlasting. And then it says, give me understanding and I shall live. Uh, verse 151, thou art near, O Lord, and all thy commandments are truth. All thy commandments, they are true. And then verse 152, concerning thy testimonies, I have known of old that thou hast founded them forever. Concerning your truth, Concerning your word, concerning your testimonies, this is what I have known. You have established them even forever. Verse 160, 116. Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. And then in verse 172, it says, My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteous. And so you will find that as you look at all these words, this is the reason why the, uh, the apostle Peter was telling the people, this is the most sure word of prophecy. And it is like a lamb. And it, it gives a light onto your pathway in Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 23. For the commandment is a lamb, and the law is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. It says the commandment is a lamb. The commandment of the Lord. The word of the Lord. That's the lamb. And it says the law of the Lord is light. It's what brings light in your pathway. And then let me go back and refresh your memory on this verse we're looking at in Second Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. And we're looking at this verse 19. As we look at dependence on the practical illumination of the scriptures. It says in this verse... We have also a most sure word of prophecy. What's the conclusion of that? What are we going to draw from that? 
What's the lesson you're teaching us, Peter, by the Spirit of God? From the very fact that the Word of God is the more sure Word of prophecy. The lesson is this. Whereunto ye do well, that ye take heed, not just to hear, not just to listen, not just to appreciate, not just to understand, but to go and observe and do, to carry them out. You do well if you will take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place. A light that shineth in a dark place. It's telling us now something that the word of God does in our lives. The light that shines in a dark place. I go to Psalm 119, verse 9. Psalm 119, we're looking at verse 9. In Psalm 119, verse 9, it says, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed? Ye do well if ye take heed. That's what Peter is telling us. And this one says, By wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereunto according to thy word. And it is that word that makes us clean. It's that word that purifies and purges us, and it makes us to live the life that we ought to live. In John chapter 15, verse 3. John chapter 15, verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. You are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. Look up here, my brothers and sisters. In the morning when you wake up, Somebody may help you and put water in the bucket. That water in the bucket doesn't make you clean yet. And somebody may take your hand and get you to the bathroom and says, here is the water and there you are. Here is the soap. Here is the sponge. All that will not make you clean until you do something. Until you pour the water on yourself and then clean up, wash. This word of God is already there in the word of God in the Bible. And it's there as we're reading the Bible together. But just my saying it, my reading it, my explaining it to you, my interpreting it to you, my applying it to you, all that will not make you clean until you take the word of God voluntarily by yourself. And you begin to apply this word of God to your spiritual life, to your family life, to your relationship with your neighbor and to the people around you. And you allow the word to point out the error in your life, the dark places in your life, and the weaknesses in your life, and the shortcomings in your life. And you allow the rebuke, and the reproof, and the correction, and the conviction of the word of God, and you allow this word, like the water that washes, to come on you, and touch every part. And you allow the sponge of the rebuke, the sponge of correction, and the sponge of conviction, and the sponge of warning, and the sponge of pointing the accusing finger to you. You allow the sponge of the word as well to clean you up. That's the only time you can be clean. Just having the water in the bucket, just having the word in the Bible, just coming to hear the word. If you don't do anything about it, it will not make you clean. But it is that personal, deliberate application of the word of God to every part of your life that brings the cleanliness and the righteousness and the holiness and the honesty and the life that pleases God. That's why it says, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. I'm reading there in verse 18. Acts 26 verse 18 to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light that's what the word of god does and that's what the preacher of the word of god is supposed to do in your life when you come together you study the word is to open your eyes and to turn you from darkness to light and from the power of satan unto god that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me that is the faith in christ so so then you understand what the Lord is telling us here. He's telling us that the word of God will be a light in our pathway. And that you are, in a, you are walking in the darkness of this world. And you need the light of the word of God. To do everything that he taught to do. So that you live a life that is straightforward. A life that brings glory unto the Lord. We go to point number two. Now, if the word of God is to benefit us. 
If the word of God is to be light in our pathway, if the word of God is to enlighten us and strengthen us and is to be spiritual profit for us, there is something that is important in handling the word of God. We must interpret that word of God correctly. Interpret that word of God correctly. Because if we don't interpret the word of God correctly, it's not light anymore. If we don't say what God meant by what he said, it will not be light anymore. If we do not allow the Lord to reveal the truth in his mind unto us through the word as applicable to our lives, it will not be light anymore. That's why it is very, very dangerous when you allow a private, erroneous interpretation of the word of God. That's the reason why it's not every book that, uh, you know, they read, interpret, they write, interpreting the Bible and commenting on verses of scripture. It's not everything that is helpful. It's only those that interpret the word of God correctly and makes the correct application upon our lives. That's why we come to this number two with a serious, serious note of warning. Point number two then, the danger of the private interpretation of scripture. Look at verse 20. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. No prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. You know, when somebody comes in a very secretive manner, in a very private manner, and in a, in a very subtle manner. And it begins to say, actually, you know, this verse of scripture. Although, you know, nobody understands this kind of interpretation. But I have this private, personal, secret interpretation. And you just have to know that God has revealed himself to me in a very special way. And just accept it. Don't tell another person. Don't go and tell another believer. Don't go and tell your, you know, deeper life, uh, brethren, because they will not accept. They will not believe this. This one is privately, secretly, specially revealed unto me. That's error. It wants to mislead you. But that's why it says, knowing this false. The very first thing you know is that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. Private interpretations are often perverted interpretations of scripture. And they are always dangerous and destructive. There are people who follow their own spirit. And they speak of their own heart. Like the false prophets of, the, of old. They misinterpret and they twist the scriptures to their own destruction. But the Bible says that there is no prophecy of scripture. And indeed, no part of the scripture came solely, entirely from the human source, but the Holy Spirit was the very source. No part of scripture was unveiled or revealed by any prophet's unaided understanding. That's the reason why no part of scripture can be properly interpreted by anyone's unaided understanding. We need the Spirit of God because the Spirit of God used those prophets uh, as, write, as a writer uses a pen. The Holy Spirit gave the prophets God's message. And it is only through the help of the same Spirit that the scriptures can be understood, can be interpreted, can be applied effectively in our lives. So then, the scriptures is not to be interpreted by private, personal ideas. It is to be interpreted by the illumination, instruction, and enlightenment of the Holy Spirit by whom it was first given. Please understand then that if you are the one having the private interpretation, if you don't want to destroy your life, throw those things away because they're not going to help you. In um, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest. They that are unlearned and unstable, they rest, they twist. It's like, you know, when you wash clothes and it has a lot of water. Then you take that uh, clothes, then you fold it together, and then you twist it. When you twist it like that, then you understand that 
you know, the water will go out. And there are these people that will take the scriptures and they rest it and they twist it and they distort it and all the water, all the nutrients, everything that should help us and cleanse us, everything is gone. These people, they twist and they rest and they distort the scripture. They misinterpret the scripture as they, and they, as they do also other scriptures to their own destruction. In Matthew chapter 4, look at this, how serious this is. Matthew chapter 4, even the devil, he also tried to, you know, quote the Bible. There are many people that quote the Bible. Backsliders quote the Bible. Sinners quote the Bible. And you'll be surprised how some backsliders will quote some verses of the scriptures to support their backsliding and to support their misbehavior and to support their evil character. Because even Satan himself, he quoted the scriptures. And you know, Satan was quoting the scriptures too. He was quoting the Bible to Jesus Christ, the very Son of God, and the Word personified. And the one, and the one that understood the Word through and through, and, was, and knew the reason why those verses were written, and he knew the very importance and the power of those scriptures. The devil came and he even tried to quote scriptures to the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 5. Then the devil taketh him up into, a hood, into the holy city, and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple, and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written. That's Satan. When a false prophet comes to you and says, It is written. Be careful. When a backslider comes to you and, you know, you are saying, Ah, you are backsliding. This thing that you are doing, look at the way you are talking. Look at the way you are acting. And then the backslider says, It is written. That's the devil speaking inside him. When somebody with familiar spirit, a witch or whatever, is, you know, is talking to you and all these, uh, you know, religious uh, witches and religious wizards and religious uh, people, I mean, familiar spirit, but they go to church. And anything they hear, the devil inside them will twist that thing, will twist that thing. And then when you are talking to them to help them, to counsel them, to advise them, and to put them right, and to take them away from their wrong, erroneous sin into the path of righteousness, these backsliding fellow, influenced by the doctrines of devils, doctrines of demons, will quote to you, it is written. Be very careful. And so you find that you find out in this verse 6, it says unto him, Satan says unto Jesus, If thou be the Son of God, canst thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus says unto him, It is written again. You will be able to understand that the word of God is not to make you tempt God. It's not to make you do some foolish things and hurt yourself. It's not to put you in the place of temptation, in the place of danger, in the place of destruction. And so Jesus said in verse 7, it is written again, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. When those people come and they twist the scriptures and they rest the scriptures and they misinterpret the scriptures to you, you better get ready and find a scripture that tells you how a child of God ought to live and you'll be able to tell them it is written in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, reading there in verse 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. Many. They corrupt the word of God. But as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Paul the apostles said, we have nothing to gain. By corrupting the word of God, misinterpreting the word of God, misapplying the word of God, somebody has to be unthinking, senseless, not thinking about eternity. Somebody has to be very, very disrespectful of the almighty God, not conscious of the power of God, not having any honor, any respect for the Almighty God to take the word of the Almighty God and twist it. And he knows God is there. Because God is everywhere, somebody has to be completely senseless. 
To be able to stand in the very presence of God and then take the word of the Almighty God and twist it and misinterpret it to corrupt and to destroy another individual. That's why Paul the Apostle said, we are not senseless. We are not unthinking. We are not foolish. We are, we are not so dumb. And we are not so wicked as to be like these many people that corrupt the word of God. But when we approach the word of God, we approach it with sincerity. And in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. And I've, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. We've renounced all that. All the dishonesty in approaching the word of God. The dishonesty in taking the word of God, in taking a verse of the scripture, and twisting it and misinterpreting to mislead other people, we have forsaken, we have renounced, we have rejected, we have turned away, we have repented from the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, never. And not handling the word of God deceitfully, never, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Uh, there were people in the Old Testament, they were walking right before, they were preaching right before, they were interpreting right before, but the time came in their lives, maybe because of looking for money, maybe because of wanting to be popular, maybe because of wanting to, uh, you know, be a good person before the people. They were interpreting the word of God in the right way before. But then later they changed and they started corrupting the word of God. And they became somebody dangerous to the people of God in Malachi chapter 2. Malachi chapter 2 verse 6. The law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his leaves. He walked, all this is past tense, he walked with me in peace and equity. And did turn many away from iniquity. You see, when you interpret the word of God correctly, when you interpret the word of God to help people discover themselves and discover their sins and discover the Lord, the Savior, and you interpret the word of God to lead them to repentance and to restoration and to righteousness, you will turn many away from their iniquity. In verse 7, for the priest leaves should keep knowledge and he should seek the law at his mouth for he is a messenger of the lord of hosts look at verse 8 what a pity but he had departed out of the way he have caused many to stumble at the law he have corrupted the covenant of levi says the lord of hosts verse 9 therefore have i also made you contemptible and base before all the people according as ye have not kept my ways and have been partial 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 in the law and they were not faithfully interpreting the word of god anymore jeremiah chapter 2 jeremiah chapter 2 Verse 7 and verse 8. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 7. And I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land and made mine heritage an abomination. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. When somebody trying to preach is not born again. When somebody trying to establish a new, a new ministry is not sanctified, not holy. When somebody trying to establish a new ministry, a new church, a new assembly, a new congregation is covetous. When somebody is saying, God has revealed to me, I'm going to start my own church. He doesn't have understanding of the fullness of the whole Bible. When somebody, oh, you know, just because he knows he must be born again, because he knows a few, a few verses of the scripture, he doesn't understand the word of God applicable to every area of his life, applicable to the marital life, applicable to even the lives of the people in the church. He just, you know, rises up, I had a vision, I had a revelation, God has shown me I should leave the church and go and start my own ministry. And when you interview him and you talk to him on the various verses of the Bible, on some difficult parts of the Bible, he knows next to nothing all he wants is just to gather some people together have a congregation and call it by a particular name so that he can be the general overseer the national overseer the international evangelist over this church and it's a pride of life and it's covetousness and it's because of looking for money 
And it's because of being incorrigible. And it's because he doesn't want to stay under teaching, under uh, somebody that can teach him and guide him and direct him in the way of the Lord. And then they mislead people and destroy many lives. The priest said not, where is he? Where is the Lord? They that handle the law, they know me not, not born again, not knowing who God is. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal. And what after the things that do not profit? The prophets prophesied by Baal. I don't know whether you read it um, last week in the papers. A particular founder of a church. He wanted a crowd. And you know, you know, you know the world. You know that these people of the world, if they have market, if they are trading. And they want people to come to their training. You know they go to herbalists. You know they go to witch doctors. You know they go to these uh, juju people to do something for them so as to attract buyers. And this uh, founder, this uh, pastor, uh, this great preacher, he went to this uh, herbalist and he said, I've established this uh, church and I need something that I'll plant there that will get people, get people. And they, and they agreed. And the Abali said, I'll take 60,000. No problem. He gave a deposit of 10,000. And said, when everything is okay and, you know, the people come and we're getting offering, I'll come back and, and give you the remaining uh, part. And so the fellow came, holding Bible, preaching. And people were coming, prophesying by Baal. That's where some of you go. And you don't know the secret of all those people. And eventually, as uh, he was gathering crowd, the abalis came one day and said, Ah, I did this thing for you. And <laughs> look at these people that you gather together. Where is my money? And the fellow said, Papa, don't worry. Don't make trouble here. I'll come and see you at home. So Papa went. After three months, this man did not come. So this fellow, the abalis came, said, Today, today, my money. And because it will now become something terrible, that the church people know, eh? So, pastor, is using juju to get us here. And some of them who came, who, I don't know, where the people people who also ran there. We say, eh? So, this man drew me from deeper life by this juju. Before the thing was scattered, the pastor hired assassins to kill this man so that he will not come back and put him to shame. It was then the man cried out, I'm not a troublemaker, I'm a herbalist. I only demand my money because when he wanted to start church, he came to me. And he wanted juju and I gave him. And the juju is working. See the people he collected. This one is not sweet or it's my juju that is doing it. That's why the police rescued that man from the pastor who wanted to assassinate, assassinate herbalists because of the deal they made. Do you know how many people are there, outside there, preaching, preaching, preaching? I mean, you people are running there. Do you know the party are you seeing? Be careful. The danger of private interpretation of scripture. And in Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23. I'm reading to you from verse 16. In Jeremiah 23 verse 16. It says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Hacking not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, that make you vain, they speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord. They say, steal unto them that despise me. The Lord has said, ye shall have peace. The people that are misbehaving, the people that are righteous, the people that are vaccinated and sinful, they say, okay, don't worry about that. You will have peace. And they say to everyone that walketh after the imagination of his own heart, no evil shall come upon you. Have you noticed all these people that are writing prophecies in the, in, the, uh, in the newspapers? The Lord said everything will be okay in our country this year. The Lord said he's going to bring prosperity this year. The Lord said he's going to create jobs for everybody this year. And everybody will be running there, will be running there. Holy Ghost is speaking. Holy Ghost is speaking. And a man comes, never says anything 
against the sins and the pollutions of the people, against the perversions of the truth, against all the immorality and against all the crime we have in the country. Every time, you know, the, the great pastor and the great, uh, you know, apostle and the great uh, prophet comes out and says, the Lord says he's not angry with our country, Nigeria. The Lord says this, our country, Nigeria, will become a great giant. And newspapers, they're happy, they're happy. They write all that. And these, you know, even our people, they are running, they are running everywhere. God says, you know, whoever you are, he knows your weaknesses, he knows your frailty, nobody is perfect, all his children rejoice this year, everything is nice for everybody. No repentance. Crowd. Just to pull the crowd. And the Lord is saying here, all these things they are saying, they say by their own mind, say no evil shall come upon you. But the Lord says, as we look at verse 21, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken to them, yet they prophesied. So those are the people many are running to. And these are the last days, and it's one of the signs of the last days. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. You know, there are doctrines of devils that people are giving heed to, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Tells us now in Romans chapter 16, telling you your duty, telling me my duty. And this is what you are to do. Romans chapter 16, verse 17. It says, now, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Avoid them. Uh, sometimes when we speak like this, so they say, uh, that pastor, he doesn't have law. Look up here. Who doesn't have law? Somebody who sees danger ahead of you, and he says, there's danger ahead, turn back. Oh, he has law. You're going on a particular road, and then there are, you know, wicked people ahead, and they're going to sniff uh, life out of you, and they're going to take all your possession, and they're going to blindfold you, and deceive you, and take everything, and even make you to divorce your wife, and make you to scatter your family, and somebody stands there, and he says, this road you are walking, those wicked people on that side, turn back, and go this other way, that's a man that has love. When I stand here, and I warn you, Against the people that will misinterpret the word of God and brainwash you and deceive you and take the confidence you have in the word of God, take it away from you. And take the love you have in your family, take it away from you. When I warn you that these people who are, the only prophecy they know is to tell that your wife is a witch. And you see, you don't have children, it's because your wife is uh, having familiar spirit. And I say these people are deceiving you, that your problem is biological. And there's no problem God cannot solve. You have married, you have married. Love your wife, love your husband, love your children. And you then, you resist me. And you go to the people that will be brainwashing you, telling you prophecies that your wife is a witch, your husband is a wizard, is the one that didn't allow you to have work, and we are telling you this is dangerous. Come out from among them. We are the people that love you. That's why it's saying, now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye learn and avoid them. Because they are such, they that are such, they serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. I come to point number three. As you look at what uh, Peter is instructing us and teaching us tonight, you look at four, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 21. It says, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. It says in old time, these holy men of God, they spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is a very strong evidence for the plenary inspiration and the entire trustworthiness of the Holy Scriptures. Supernatural influence was brought to bear upon divinely chosen men to speak and to write the mind and the word of God. These inspired writings, that is the Holy Scriptures, confirmed by Christ. They are completely trustworthy, completely authoritative. 
The message of the Bible can be believed, can be obeyed with all confidence because this is the word of God. This is not the opinion of man. It says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man. This is referring to all the prophets of the Bible. They received, they revealed, they recorded the scriptures. It came not by the will of man. It was not of human origin. It says, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. These men first were made holy, holy men of God. They were made suitable channels to transmit the divine truth to mankind. And it says they were moved. That means they were born along. They were carried along. They were influenced by the Holy Ghost. And they spoke and they wrote only by the influence of the spirit of the living God. The scriptures then demand that there should, we should give earnest attention. We should give heed because it is a sure guide unto the eternal city of God. The pages of the scriptures, as we read, uh, it's the only way of salvation that it reveals. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All scripture, not some, not a part of scripture. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. That's why it's trustworthy. That's why it's dependable. That's why you can trust it. That's why you can believe it. That's why you can have complete, total, unshakable confidence in the word of God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, that the child of God, that the believer may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We're told in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. It's still telling us about the very fact that these scriptures were given by the Lord himself. By the Spirit of God Himself. And what these people wrote now, they wrote now as led by the Spirit of God. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto our fathers by the prophets, as in these last days spoken unto us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, by whom also He made the worlds. And that's the reason why you depend on the scriptures because you know this is the Lord speaking and the Bible is like no other book. In 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 11, searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. It's telling us that is the spirit of Christ in them that made them to write all the things they wrote. In fact, as you look at some of the prophets, the Lord even dictated the things he wanted to write. He dictated it unto them. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 2. Jeremiah chapter 36, verse 2. It says, take thee a roll of a book and write therein. All the words that I have spoken unto thee. You see, it was dictated unto him. And the Lord said, take a roll of a book and begin to write down all those words I have spoken. In Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28. Verse 25. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well, spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah. Well, spoke the Holy Ghost through Isaiah, the prophet, unto our fathers. So then you understand, these were not words of men. These were the words coming through the Holy Ghost. Acts chapter 1 verse 16. Acts 1, 16, men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke. This scripture must be fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spoke. In John chapter 12, verse 49, John 12, Verse 49, for I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say 
and what I shall speak. And you see, all these words, they were not just words that somebody just thought out that they wanted to say. He said, even Jesus Christ said, I've not spoken about myself, and I've not spoken just what came out of my mind. He said, my Father, the Almighty God, gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting whatsoever i speak therefore even as the father has said unto me so speak i john chapter 14 verse 26 but the comforter which is the holy ghost whom the father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever i have said unto you you will see now the combination of the Holy Spirit and the Father, God the Father, and Jesus Christ combining all together to give us this word of life eternal. In John chapter 16, verse 13. John 16, verse 13. It says, how be it? When he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and it will show you things to come. Well, it's very clear as we have looked at the word of God that all these things that you are seeing, all these things that you are reading, they're the very words of the Lord. Why then is it that some people do not receive? Why is it some people do not believe? Why is it some people do not accept this word coming from God directly through these holy men and they're speaking unto us to correct our lives, to chastise us sometimes and to put us right sometimes and to punch and purify us sometimes and to be able to make us get ready for the coming of the Lord. It tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. From verse 13 it says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Verse 14, But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judge of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. The word of God has come to you today. And the Lord has told you, you can depend upon the word of God for practical illumination of the scriptures. And then he warns you of the danger of private interpretation of the scriptures. Now tells you the doctrine of the plenary inspiration of scripture. And this scripture is given unto us for doctrine, for righteousness, for reproof, for correction. So that you as a child of God will be perfect, thoroughly prepared unto all good works. I pray that what you have heard today will do something in your heart that will be nearer and closer to the Lord. Let's spend some time before we go. Rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. That the Lord himself will help you to benefit from the word. That this sure word of prophecy will have a very good, conspicuous, important place in your life. It will be a light shining in the dark parts of your life. You will not get involved with private, secret, dangerous, personal interpretation of the Bible. But you will understand that when you come to the Bible, these are the words of the Almighty God. And these words, they are the prophecy, the sure prophecies that the Holy Ghost himself breathed into them because holy men of God, they spoke as they were moved and inspired by the Spirit of God. Take the word of God serious today. Let you do something in your life. If you need to repent, let it lead you to repentance. If, there's, if you need restitution, let it lead you to that restitution. If you need restoration, let it lead you to that restoration. Let the word of God do something in your life tonight so you will not be hearing in vain. Let it be light in your pathway. Let it be light in your pathway. In your marriage, in your family, in your work, in your relationship with your neighbors, in your relationship with your wife, in your relationship with your husband. Let this word of God purge you, purify you. Do something in your life. Shine as light 
in the dark areas of your life. Run away from all those false prophets. Run away from all those teachers of false doctrine. Don't allow them to destroy your life. Anchor your soul on this infallible, unchanging word of the eternal God. The word of God is able to make you everything you ought to be. Trust that word. Believe that word. Obey that word. Allow that word to cleanse you, purify you, correct you, and rectify the wrong things in your life. Let the word have a chance to do all that is necessary to make you who you ought to be in the sight of God.